I'm Drew Stevenson, and this is a lecture for my professional responsibility class about ABA Model Rule 1.16a, which addresses when it's mandatory to withdraw from representing a client or to decline to represent a new client. We'll have other videos about other subsections of 1.16, uh, but this one is focused on mandatory withdrawal. So let's dive in. Model Rule 1.16a begins with a provision requiring a lawyer to decline to represent a client, a new client, or withdraw from a representation that is already underway if, one, the representation will result in a violation of the rules of professional conduct or other law, two, the lawyer's physical or mental condition materially impairs the lawyer's ability to represent the client, or three, the lawyer is discharged. Now, there's a prefatory clause at the beginning of 1.16a that says, except as stated in paragraph C. We're going to talk about paragraph C later, but for purposes of this um, subsection, what you need to know is this part. When ordered to do so by a tribunal, a lawyer shall continue representation notwithstanding good cause for terminating the representation. So even if you think you should or maybe even have to withdraw from representing a client, if the matter is already pending before a judge, the judge does have authority to order a lawyer to stay on the case until the trial is over. Um, if the judge doesn't want the trial disrupted or have to declare a mistrial. And in that case, you won't be subject to discipline. And that's generally true with all of the model rules for purposes of the exam, at least, or the MPRE. If you are complying with a very specific court order to do something, you're probably not subject to discipline, even if the court order puts you in tension with some of the requirements or prohibitions of the model rules. So let's start unpacking the one, two, and three we talked about before. First, the violation of model rules or other law. A very common situation is a conflict of interest. So if you know you have a conflict of interest before you undertake the representation, normally you should decline to represent that person. And of course, in some circumstances, a, a conflict is consentable. The client can give consent or the affected clients. Some conflicts are not consentable. And when we talk about violation of other rules, like there's rules prohibiting fraud on the court and things like that, and laws that, that um, prohibit you as a lawyer from helping a client commit crimes or defraud other people. If a client comes to you and basically wants help laundering money or something like that, you have to decline the representation. If you have already agreed and the representation is underway and you now realize that what the client is, is using your legal services for is something illegal, at that point you have to withdraw from the representation. And keep in mind that if you don't have a law license in uh, the state where the representation will occur um, or if your license has been suspended, then that would be a violation of uh, the ethical rules and other laws for you to provide representation. So if your license gets suspended, even for an unrelated matter because you're, uh, of an ethical violation, you're disciplined, you have to withdraw from representing all of your other clients. Comment 2 to 1.16 says that a lawyer ordinarily must decline or withdraw from representation if the client demands that the lawyer engage in conduct that is illegal or violates the rules of professional conduct or other law. Now, keep in mind, and this is very important for the MPRE, a lawyer is not obliged to decline or withdraw simply because a client suggests such a course of conduct. Maybe the client made the suggestion hoping that the lawyer would not be prohibited by law or the ethics rules from the activity. So sometimes a client suggests something, and when you say, I can't do that, that's illegal, or the ethical rules prohibit that, the client says, oh, I'm sorry, and they back off. And if you have a test question on my exam or the MPRE where uh, the client suggests something and then the lawyer says, I can't do that, and then the client backs down and says, okay, never mind, um, let's do this instead, and it's uh, something permissible, the lawyer doesn't have to withdraw just because the 
the um, client suggested something initially that the lawyer can't do. In fact, if one of your answer choices is the lawyer should tell the client he can't do that, and if the client accepts that answer, the lawyer can continue with the representation, that's usually the right answer to the question. 1.16a2, you may remember, says the lawyer's physical or mental condition materially impairs the lawyer's ability to represent the client. I have given some examples of this. I have a picture here um, that's sort of a joke of someone in a full body cast uh, uh, trying to work at a computer. I actually know a lawyer who was in a, a terrible accident several years ago and was in a full body cast and traction in the hospital. And um, his spouse notified his secretary, he was a solo practitioner, who initiated the emergency protocol. There was another lawyer who had agreed to step in uh, in an emergency and kind of triage the cases, notify clients and courts and other parties that something had happened to the lawyer, ask for continuances, and, um, and basically offered to take over the representation until the lawyer recovered a few months later and could return to his office. So let's look at um, a few examples uh, from uh, the last 10 years or so of lawyers who have been disciplined under this particular provision. In Ohio in 2012, a lawyer's addiction to prescription drugs and difficulties dealing with her own child custody matter materially impaired her ability to represent clients, a disciplinary board found. In Kansas in 2014, a uh, lawyer had suffered from severe depression that impaired the lawyer's ability to represent clients. In Iowa in 2015, there's a case where a lawyer had bipolar disorder and alcoholism, which coincided, in the words of the um, court, to, uh, to produce an extended period of professional dysfunction. Moving on, in 2016 in South Carolina, um, there was an ethics decision where a uh, lawyer's physical and mental health problems contributed to mishandling of a client matter, and the lawyer was subject to discipline. You're supposed to withdraw from the representation if you are struggling physically or mentally, even if your doctor and loved ones are telling you to keep going and keep fighting and try to continue with your normal activities. You have a duty to your client, and your client is entitled to a lawyer who can provide full, competent representation to the conclusion of the matter. In Maryland in 2019, a lawyer's illness led to extended hospitalizations and resulting in many continuances, failure to provide discovery, failure to attend a hearing, an order for sanctions from the judge, and ultimately dismissal of the client's case. And so you can end up with sort of a cascade of bad results for your client if you're not honest with yourself about when you can't do it and you need to withdraw. Okay, 1.16a3 is when the client fires you. And keep in mind that uh, this could happen. A client has a right to discharge a lawyer at any time with or without cause. In that situation, you have to stop working. Sometimes lawyers uh, are resentful. They feel like they've been doing a good job and the client fired them unreasonably or for a terrible reason. So they keep doing a little bit of work and billing the client for a few more weeks. When the client fires you, generally speaking, your representation in the matter is over. Now, there's two exceptions to this that we uh, are going to talk about a little bit later. Um, one is if you have a trial underway and the judge says, oh, no, you have to stay on the case and finish the trial. I don't care what the party wants or what your client wants. Then you have to do that and you can get compensated for that time. Uh, and similarly, after a client fires you, you have, we're going to see in the next video that you have some ongoing duties to return clients papers and um, help them with the transition. Maybe uh, if they get a new lawyer and that lawyer wants uh, to, to you to help them get up to speed on the case. And it's reasonable, I think, for you to get compensated for the time that you have to spend basically protecting the client's interests. But you can't just ignore the client and keep uh, filing motions or doing new work on the case that the client doesn't want you to do. Also, the client will probably have to pay for your the lawyer services, your fees, up to the point where they terminate you. 
if you had agreed to do it on a contingent fee basis, uh, then maybe you'll be able to get um, sue the client for compensation under a theory of quantum merit or something like that. Um, the model rule comments encourage lawyers to kind of cover your back, prepare a written statement reciting the circumstances, like the conversation that happened and your understanding of what the client said, because there can be misunderstandings. And there's things that sometimes people say things when they're upset or having an argument. And the next day they think about it and they calm down and they don't feel that way anymore. And they don't really communicate that to the other person. They just sort of un take back what they said in their own mind. Um, and so there are situations where a lawyer thinks he's been fired by the client and the client thinks the lawyer is still working on the case because they were just uh, speaking when they were really upset. So if you think you've been fired by your client, uh, put it in an email or a letter to the client. Um, my understanding from our phone conversation or the conversation at the courthouse is that you uh, no longer want me to represent you. So that concludes my representation in the matter. And I would encourage you to seek um, other representation from another lawyer as soon as possible. And I'm happy to return uh, your uh, files and papers and so forth. Um, now, what about court appointed counsel? As you know, in this country, sometimes indigent defendants are entitled to a uh, lawyer at the expense of the state. And the rules vary about whether a client can fire um, court appointed counsel and how many times they can do that. Um, and a client who is seeking to fire you, if you're appointed counsel, um, should be given a full explanation of the consequences. Are they going to get another lawyer? Are they going to have to proceed pro se? Um, what's going to happen? Uh, will it result in a um, delay in the trial or the ma pending matter? Keep in mind that uh, it's usually necessary to get court approval um, even if the withdrawal is mandatory. So uh, e even if now you have a conflict of interest, the client has fired you, um, you've become disabled and can't continue with the representation. Now, a reasonable judge will approve this, but uh, there are cases where a judge felt like it would disrupt uh, um, a trial that was about to start the next day or was already in the middle of a trial and ordered the lawyer to continue with the representation. Um, also, keep in mind that even for permissible withdrawal, court approval or notice is usually required before a lawyer withdraws from any pending uh, lit litigation. Now, normally this is a formality that most courts have a standardized form that's a motion to withdraw and it's approved. Again, unless the court thinks it would be disruptive to a trial that's, already, that's about to start or is already underway. Um, sometimes a judge may request an explanation for the withdrawal. And as a lawyer, you should avoid betraying client confidentiality when answering. So this isn't an excuse for you to dish um, about the client or betray a lot of confidential or privileged information. It, you should basically say something like um, professional considerations require termination of the representation. That's sort of the ABA's suggestion. Or you could say ethical requirements or the disciplinary rules um, uh, require that I stop, I, I can't proceed with the representation. In some cases, you could actually tell the judge which rule you're concerned about without really saying anything prejudicial to the client. If you now have a conflict of interest that arose after the representation began, you could probably say, Your Honor, I have a conflict of interest and I can't uh, continue with the representation. Um, other times, let's say the client is trying to get you to do something illegal, you can't betray the client's competence. You could, you would, and say, well, judge, the client wants me to do uh, such and such. Instead, you would have to say, I, I can't ethically proceed with a representation or the profession, the rules of professionalism um, compel me to withdraw from this representation at this time. That concludes our video about ABA Model Rule 1.16a, mandatory withdrawal. Our next video will be about when it's permissible to withdraw from representing a client. So make sure you watch that video next.